Book Five, Chapter Eleven of Clara Vaughan, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Clara Vaughan, Volume Three by R. D. Blackmore. Book Five, Chapter Eleven at the door we found mrs fletcher just returned from lady cranberry's and eager to say a great deal which could not now be listened to having proved the speed of our horse i begged the cabman to wait for a quarter of an hour and then take us to paddington at any fare he pleased so long as he drove full gallop this suited his views very nicely and knowing mr shelfer as every one in london does so at least i am forced to believe he fain would have kept me ten minutes of the fifteen to tell of charlie's knowing this how he had kept it all dark as could be you see miss and had won three hundred and twenty five pounds without reckoning the odd money miss reckon it then mr cabman and i ran upstairs full speed after telling mrs shelfer the sum lest she should be cheated in five minutes i was ready and came out of my bedroom into the sitting-room with my hat in one hand and the little bag in the other and there instead of mrs fletcher i found whom conrad very pale and ill he looked so unlike himself that i was shocked and instead of leaping to him fell upon a chair he mistook me and approached very slowly but with his dear old smile how my heart beat how i longed to be in his arms but they looked too weak to hold me oh miss vaughan i know everything will you ever forgive me never my own darling while you call me that forgive you indeed can i ever forgive myself for the evil i have thought of you how very ill you look come and let me kiss you well but instead of my doing that he had to do it for me for i was quite beaten at last and fainted away in his arms by this folly five minutes were lost and I had so much to say to him and more to think of than twenty such heads could hold But he seemed to think that it must be all right so long as he had me there. Oh Connie I said through my tears at last My own pet Connie come with me your father is in such danger Life of my heart. I will follow you by the very next train this one. I cannot go by I could wait for no explanation and he seemed inclined to give none perhaps this was the reason that he spent all the time in kissing me which much as i enjoyed it would have done quite as well at leisure be that as it may there was no time to talk about it he said it did his lips good and i believe it did they were so pale at first and now so fine a red suddenly in the midst of it a great voice was heard from the passage why now whatever be us to do with the chillers out i ran with my hair down as usual and a great flush in my cheeks but i did not let any one see me leave them here to be sure leave them here mr huxtable they shall have my rooms and in all london they would not find such a hostess as mrs shelfer there was no time to consider it the throat of hurry is large and gulps almost any suggestion away we went full gallop the farmer was on the box how the driver found room i can't say mrs fletcher and i inside all consulting her watch every minute across the regent's park scattering the tame wild ducks past marylebone church and the yorkshire stingo and edgware road we saved it by just two minutes although i had taken his ticket the farmer would not come with us but went in a second-class carriage They blue feather beds trimmed with pig's tails is too good for the likes of I miss Clara And I should be afeard all the way that the missus was rating of me for my leg room I paid parlor price coming up and went in the kitchen wagons because it seemed only fair as I take such a daily room I Knew that none ever could turn him from what he considered just and therefore allowed him to ride where he pleased but a dozen times I thought we should have lost him on the way for at every station when the train stopped He made a point of coming to our window which he had marked with a piece of chalk and Humbly acting our pardon, but was we all right and no fire 
he couldn't think what they wanted not he with tempting god almighty fast not fast enough for me i told him every time whereupon he put on his hat with a sigh and said he supposed i was born to it and yet all the time he seemed to consider that he was protecting me somehow and once he called me his dearie to the great surprise of the other passengers and the horror of mrs fletcher seeing which he repented hastily and miss vaughned me three times in a sentence with a hot flush on his forehead at swindon where we changed carriages he pulled out very mysteriously from an inner breast pocket a little sack tied with whipcord and in which i do believe the simple soul had deposited all his hard-earned prize money then he led us to the counter proud to show that he had been there before and earnestly begged for the honour of treating us to a drop of somewhat his countenance fell so on my refusal that i was fain to cancel it and to drink at his expense a glass of iced sherry and water while mrs fletcher with much persuasion and simpering and for the sake of her poor inside that had been so long her enemy ventured on a wee wee thimbleful of cognac the farmer himself much abashed at the splendour around him which he told me in a whisper beat pewter wills out and out and even the fortescue arms would not call for anything until i insisted upon it being hard pressed he asked at last hoping no offence of the lady for a pint of second cider the young woman turned up her nose but i soon made her turn it down again and fetch him as the nearest thing a bottle of sparkling perry as always happens when one is in a great hurry the train was an hour behind its time and the setting sun was casting gold upon the old cathedral to my mind one of the lightest and grandest buildings in england though the farmer prefers that squat and heavy norman thing at exeter when we glided smoothly and swiftly into the gloucester station i fully intended to have sent an electric message from london not for the sake of the carriage which mattered nothing but to warn my dear uncle at paddington however we found no time to do it and so stupid i was that i never thought of telegraphing from swindon to make up by over alacrity in a case of far less importance i went to the office at gloucester and sent this message to tiverton then the nearest station to exmoor farmer has won and got the money clara vaughan to mrs huxtable the amazement of the farmer i cannot stop to describe no time was lost by doing this for i had ordered a pair of horses and they were being put to then stimulating the driver we dashed off for vaughan st mary anxious as i was and wretched at the thought of what we might find so exhausted was my frame by the thaumatrope of the last six and thirty hours that i fell asleep and woke not until we came to the lodge old whitehead came out hat in hand and whispered something into mrs fletcher's ear that good old lady had been worrying me dreadfully about her jams for the weather was so hot she was sure all the fruit would be over etc none of which could i listen to now as whitehead spoke i saw through my half opened lashes that she started violently but she would not tell me what it was and i did not want to intrude on secrets that might be between them the father also diverted attention by calling from the box as we wound into the avenue dear heart alive this bait all soldiers as ever i see miss clara or even the militia to coom why our thicky treesies must be growed so a puffers just over again one another and all of a bigness too well well coachman was you ever to devonshire i do believe those men of devon see nothing they admire without thinking at once of their county at the front door the butler met us which surprised me rather as being below his dignity he was a trusty old servant who had been under thomas henwood and had come back to his place since the general turnout of the household now he looked very grave and sad and instead of leading me on drew me aside in the hall it was getting dark and the fire in the west was dying great plumes of asparagus shame it was to cut them waved under the ancient mantelpiece bad news it is miss clara they all seemed to call me that very bad news indeed miss but i hope you was prepared for it what do you mean 
why haven't you heard about poor master's death dead my dear uncle dead do you mean to say i could not finish the sentence no miss only today and not as you thinks no fit at all nor paralytic stroke he went off quiet as a lamb as near as could be three o'clock he was very poorly before but he had a deal to do and would not give in on no account he was sitting by himself in the study after breakfast and at last he rang the bell and told them to send me up when i went in he was bolt upright in his chair with a beautiful smile on his face but so pale white i ought to say miss and so weak he could hardly move john he says yes sir says i john he says again you are a most respectable man and i can trust you with anything in the world john take this letter for miss vaughan and put it with your own hands into her own directly the moment she comes back i am rather uneasy about the poor girl he says as it were to himself which miss vaughan sir says i your mistress john can't you see what is written on it and now help me upstairs and if ever i spoke to you harshly john hoxton i ask your pardon for it you will find i haven't forgotten you and with that i helped him upstairs miss and i had almost to carry him and then he says help me to bed john i would like to die in my own bed and it will save some trouble and let me look out of the window what a lovely day it is it reminds me quite of the south so i set him up in the bed miss handy altogether and beautiful and he could see two larks on the lawn and he asked me what they was then he says thank you john you have done it wonderful well and i hope they won't speak evil of me round this place after i am gone i have tried to do my duty john as between man and man though i would be softer with them if i had my time over again now send my daughter to me though i wish i had seen my son john but i ought to be very thankful and what's more i am all of you likes miss lily unless they tell me stories john sir says i we worships her though not like our own miss vaughan ah john hoxton did you say that to him i wonder or interpolate ex post facto so he looked very pleased at that miss and he says again john let all that love her know that she is the living image of her mother now go and send her quickly but john take care not to frighten my little darling so i went and found miss lily got along with the shetland pony and giving it bits of clover and i sent her up and jane too for i was dreadfully frightened and you away miss at the time and what come afterwards i can't tell only no luncheon went up and there was orders not to ring the bell for the servants dinner and i heard poor miss lily crying terrible all along the corridor and i did hear say that his last words was and he trying to raise his arms toward the window blessed be god i can see my own lily but she weren't that side of the bed miss so he must have made some mistake no he meant her mother where is my cousin now in your own room miss lying down they tell me she did take on so awful jane thought she would have died but at last she brought her round a little and persuaded her to lie down she calls for you miss every time she comes to herself i went straightway to the poor little dear without even stopping to read the letter placed in my hands the room in which she lay was dark for jane who was watching in my little parlour whispered to me that the poor child could not bear the lamplight her eyes were so weak and sore at first lily did not know me and it went to my heart after all my own great sorrows to hear the sad low moaning she lay on my own little bed with her pale face turned to the wall her thick hair all over her shoulders and both hands pressed to her heart annie franks had been many times to ask for her but lily would not let her come in bending over i laid my cheek on lily's and softly whispered her name at last she knew me and took my hand and turned her sweet lips to kiss me then she sobbed and cried most bitterly but i saw that it did her good by and by she said with her fingers among my hair 
oh clara isn't it hard to find him at last and love him so and only for three days and then and then and then my pet to let him go where his heart has been nearly twenty years would you be so selfish as to rob your mother of him and to go so happy i am sure he has come with me and see oh no oh no i cannot and her lovely young form trembled at the thought of visiting death yes you can if you only try and i am sure that he would wish it that you and i should kneel hand in hand and bless him as others shall kneel some day by us what lily afraid of her father then i have no fear of my uncle god knows that i spoke so not from harshness only in the hope to do her good if you really think he would wish it dear yes it is a duty i owe him he would be disappointed in me if i failed oh how he longed to see you once more dear clara but he felt that you were safe and he said you would come to see him though he could not see you he talked of you quite to the last you and darling connie connie will be here tonight no oh i am so glad and a bright flash of joy shone forth from the eyes that were red with weeping something cold pushed quietly in between us and then gave a sniff and a sigh it was darling judy's nose he had learned in the lower regions where he always dwelled in my absence that miss clara was come home and knowing my name as well as his own he had set off at once in quest of me after offering me his best love and respects with the tip of his tongue as he always did he looked from one to the other of us with his eyebrows raised in surprise and the deepest sorrow and sympathy in his beautiful soft brown pupils i declare it made us cry more than ever oh clara sobbed lily at length he did howl so last night do you think he could have known it his eyes dropped as she was telling me they always did when he thought he had been a bad dog now go down judy good little judy go to mrs fletcher a great friend of mine is with her away he trotted obediently and his tail recovered its flourish before he had got to the corner now darling let us go there said the poor child trembling again i will go anywhere with you hand in hand we walked into my uncle's chamber young as i was and still thoughtless in many ways twice before now had i gazed on the solemn face of death but never not even in my mother's holy countenance saw i such perfect peace and bliss as dwelt in and seemed to smile from my dearest uncle's lineaments the life in youth puffed here and there by every captious breeze of pride in its prime becalmed a while on the halcyon deep of love then tempest tossed through the lonely dark and shattered of late by blows from god that life whose flaw of misanthropy and waste of high abilities had been redeemed ennobled even by a pure and perfect love now it had bidden farewell to all below the clouds calmly happily best of all in faith we knelt beside the bed and prayed lily as a catholic clara as a protestant that we and all we loved might have so blessed an end then we both sat peacefully with a happy awe between us in the dark recess behind the velvet curtains two wax candles were burning on the table towards the door and by their light the face we loved looked not wan but glorious as with a silver glory clasping each the other's waist and kissing away each other's tranquil tears how long we sat there i know not neither what high fluttering thoughts thoughts or angels which they be stealthily a door was opened not the door of heaven not even the main door of the room we sat in but a narrow side door through it crept with crawling caution he whom most of all men i now despised and pitied lily did not hear his entrance neither did she see him but my eyes and ears were keen from many a call of danger stunned for a while by the heavy blow that met me on my return i had forgotten all about him i mean at least all about his present design i had indeed told the farmer 
for it was only fair to do so my object in bringing him down and how i relied on his wonderful strength and courage having then no other to help me but since i got home and heard the sad tidings it seemed a mere thing for contempt not even lepardo della croce could catch a departed spirit so and in the landslip of the mind sapped by its own and sliding swiftly into another's sorrow i had not even ordered that the house should be watched at all i had not even posted guidice who had a vendetta of his own anywhere on guard with a stiletto still concealed all but the handle on which the light fell he approached the bed wriggling along and crouching as a cat or leopard would then he rose and stood upright at the side of the bed not our side but the other and glared upon his intended victim's face i pushed lily back behind the curtain as if with the weight of my bosom while i watched the whole never in all my tempestuous life of all the horrible things i have seen and heard and shuddered at saw i anything so awful so utterly beyond not only description but conception as that disdainful arrogant face when the truth burst on him not the body only but the mind and soul if god had cursed him with one were smitten black all of a lump as if he had leaped from a train at full speed into a firing cannon's mouth before he had time to recover i advanced and faced him all dressed in white i was with my black hair below my waist for i had thrown off my travelling frock and taken what first came to hand they tell me i look best in white it shows my hair and eyes so he believed that it was a spirit the vendetta spirit of the other side and he cowered before me i was the first to speak lepardo della croce it is the rebuke of heaven dust upon ashes such is man's revenge i have nursed but scorn it now go in peace and pray the almighty that he be not like you stop i will show you forth you have a vindictive foe here who would tear you to atoms i led the way trembling at every corner lest we should meet guidice for i knew he would not obey me if he once caught sight of this hated one after standing silently unable to take his eyes from the placid face of the dead lepardo began to follow me walking as if in a dream meeting none i led him forth along the corridor down the end staircase and out on the eastern terrace there i waved him off and pointed to the dark refuge of the shrubbery beyond the mineral spring the moonlight slept upon the black water narrowly threading the grass over our heads drooped the ivy the creeper of oblivion the murderer turned and looked at me hitherto he had glided along with his head down as in bewilderment oh that he had said one word of sorrow or repentance he spoke not at all but shuddered as the ivy rustled above us his face was pale as the moonlight did he see in me something higher than the spirit of vendetta i pointed again to the trees and urged him away from the house he had two strong enemies there a minute might make all the difference breaking as if from a spell he waved his italian cap and his lithe strong figure was lost among the portugal laurels for a minute i stood there wondering then slowly went round the house corner and gazed at the grey stone mullions of the room which had been my father's i was still in the anguish of doubt and misgiving what right had an ignorant girl like me to play judge and jury or more to absolve and release a crime against all humanity when a mighty form stood before me and guidice all bristle and fire dashed forth from the door in the gable with command and entreaty i called him but he heard me not neither looked at me but scoured the ground like a shadow quartering it as a pointer does only he carried his nose down dang my slow bones said the farmer but i'll have him yet miss i seed him go i'll soon find him no no i won't have him stopped he shall go free and repent by your lave miss it can't be a man as have done what he have as no right to play buff with never before did i go again your will miss but axin your pardon i must now look the girt dog no better 
as the dog found the track and gave tongue the farmer rushed from me and followed him dashing headlong into the shrubbery after leaping the mineral spring at the very spot where the footprints had been judy and farmer huxtable were fast friends already for that dog always made up his mind in a moment on the question of like and dislike for a time i was so horror-struck that no power of motion was left i knew that the farmer was quite unarmed he carried not even a stick even with the great dog to help him what could he do against firearms which lepardo was sure to have what should i say to his wife and children what should i say to myself if john huxtable fell a victim to that wily and desperate criminal resolved to be present if possible i rushed down the narrow path which led to the little park gate where probably they would pass i was right they had passed and flung it wide open breathless i looked around for hence several tracks diverged no living thing could i see or hear but the beating of my heart which seemed to be in my throat and the hooting of an owl from the hollow elm at the corner i flung myself down on the dewy grass and strained my eyes in vain until by some silver birch trees on which the moonlight was glancing i saw first a gliding figure that looked like a deer in the distance then a tall man running rapidly away i made by a short cut for the witchier grave as the end of the lake was called for i knew that the path they were on led thither quite out of breath i was for i had run more than half a mile when i came full upon a scene which would have robbed me of breath if i had any at the end of a little dingle under a willow tree and within a few feet of the water stood lepardo della croce brought to bay at last a few yards from him guidas was struggling furiously to escape the farmer's grasp perhaps no other hand in england could have held him his eyes kindled in the moonlight like the red stars of a rocket and a deep roar of baffled rage came from the surge of his chest as he champed his monstrous fangs and volleyed all the spring of his loins the farmer leaned backward to hold him and stayed himself by a tree stump sharp now surrender wally man in the name of the queen and the lord chief justice and the high sheriff of devon i tell ye surrender dang this here dog surrender and i won't hurt thee and i won't let the girt dog lepardo answered calmly in a voice that made my blood cold do you value your life if so stand out of my way i have death here for you and five other dogs I saw the barrel of a large revolver with a stream of light upon it he held it steadily as a tobacco pipe i am glad he owned some courage for my life i could not stir all the breath in my body was gone dear heart alive thicky man must be a fool said the farmer quite contemplatively don't he know who i be do we reckon thy peppermint twisties that can hurt jen uxtable I see there were some many in a small shop window in Lunnon. Surrender now, Willie, thou shalt have a fair trial at Hexeter as in Devonshire man is took ye, and a dull more nor he deserves. Sharp now, I be afeard of the girt dog getting loose. Dang you, dog, stone up a bit. And the farmer approached him coolly, trailing the dog along, as if what the murderer held in his hand was a stick of Spanish licorice fool if you pass that stump your great carcass shall lie on it fire away said the farmer i knowed you was a coward and i be glad it be so now mind if so be you shut i lets the dog go honour bright because he dunno what fair play be but if you hearken to reason i'll give ye one chance more i'll tie up the dog wi me braces to thicky tree allers wear cart rope i does and I'll take ye Queen's prisoner with my left hand and t'other never out of me breeches pocket. Look ye zee leg, Tiki. And the farmer buried his right hand in his capacious trousery. The Corsican seemed astonished. Fool hardy clown, worthy son of a bull headed country. Stop at the stump then, take that. Out blazed the pistol with a loud ring, and I saw that the farmer was struck. He let go the dog and leaped up. His right hand fell on Lepardo's temple and seemed to crush the skull in. Another shot at the same instant, and down fell the farmer heavily. Great God! I screamed. 
and leaped forward but greed ice was loose to avenge him though i could swear that it was on a corpse corpse or living body over and over it rolled with the dog's fangs in its throat i heard a gurgle a tearing and grinding and then a loud splash in the water the dog and the murderer both of man and dog sunk in the lake together twenty feet out from the shore rose above water one moment drawn ghastly white in the moonbeams the last view seen till the judgment day of the face of lepardo della croce almost drowned himself for he would not release his father's murderer while a grasp was in him staggered at last to the shore my noble and true dog Guidice. he fell down a while to recover his breath then shook himself gratefully tottered to me where i knelt at the farmer's side and wagged his tail for approval the water from his chest and stomach dripped on the farmer's upturned face and for a moment revived him no belt no tino lad i don't take it Zimth lake a ticket for chating i dunno as i'd take the money if it weren't for the poor chillers nine chillers now and another a comin mustn't drink no more beer but beanie shall have his and his head fell back on my lap and i felt sure that he was dead how i screamed and shrieked till i lay beside him with judy licking my face none can tell but the gamekeepers who had heard the shots and came hurrying of this lower end of the lake they happened to be most jealous for a brood of pintail ducks very rare i believe in england had been hatched here this summer and no one was allowed to go near them poor judy kept all the men aloof till i was able to speak to him then i perceived that he as well was bleeding wounded perhaps by the poniard as he leaped on his enemy's breast it had entered just under the shoulder and narrowly missed the heart they took us at once towards the house carrying the farmer and judy on the woman floodgates of the stream called the witch's brook which here fell into the lake as we entered the avenue being obliged to take the broad way though much further round we heard a carriage coming it was the one i had sent for conrad with a hurried note to break the sad news of his father's death he had been detained in london by a challenge he found from lepardo which was of course a stratagem to keep him out of the way how delighted i was to see his calm brave face again as he leaped down and took my tottering form in his arms in a minute he understood everything and knew what was best to be done he would not allow them to place the poor farmer in the carriage as they foolishly wanted to do but laid the rude litter down examined the wounds by the lamplight and bound them up most cleverly with the appliances of the moment oh conrad will he die no my darling i hope not but he must if they had let him bleed so much longer i never heard that you were a surgeon connie could i call myself a sculptor without having studied anatomy my dearest one how you tremble go home in the carriage and give directions for us a room downstairs with a wide doorway and plenty of air i will stay with them and see that they bear him gently poor judy may go with you thus conrad saw for the first time the hearth and home of his ancestors with his father lying dead there and his avenger carried helpless but i met him at the door did that comfort you just a little my darling end of book five chapter eleven Book Five, Chapter Eleven of Clara Vaughan, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fiddlesticks. Clara Vaughan, Volume Three by R. D. Blackmore. Book Five, Chapter Eleven. The lake was dragged that night and all the following day, in spite of the gamekeeper's strong remonstrance for the sake of the tender pintails but nothing whatever was found except the italian cap the witch's grave invisible i am glad to say from the house is more than forty feet deep when the water is at its lowest three or four years afterwards young william haight caught a monstrous pike in the lake and sent him with our permission to be stuffed at gloucester 
like the famous fish of samos this pike had swallowed a ring which was sent to conrad by the gloucester gunmaker it was lepardo's seal ring the cross of the family engraved in a bloodstone with l d c below it whether the midnight stabber died by the blow of an english fist or suffered vivisection through a dog's vendetta an institution more excusable and dignified than man's is known to him and him alone who holds the scales of retribution and laughs in scorn as well as wrath at our attempts to swing them for are we not therein ourselves and how shall the best and strongest of us carry the thing he is carried in right glad i am and ever shall be that i moved not in the awful scene which closed my father's tragedy through conrad's skill and presence of mind the dear farmer's life was saved we sent to gloucester immediately for the cleverest surgeon there and he owned he could not have fixed the ligatures better though he did what connie durst not attempt he extracted the murderer's bullet it was the first shot that did all the mischief being aimed deliberately at the large and tender heart thanks to the waving of the willow tree for lepardo was a known marksman it had missed by about two inches the second shot fired quite close and wildly had grooved the left temple and stricken the farmer senseless for six weeks now our dear friend whose patience amazed all but me was kept from his devonshire home to london i sent at once for the two children of mr daw and would have sent to devon as well for kind and good mrs huxtable but her husband would not hear of it by anne maples who had left lady cranberry shockingly on hearing from mrs fletcher that i would take her again he sent to his wife kind love and best duty and for goodness sake stop at home now no call to make a fool of yourself and the farm go to rack and ruin there be fuss enough bout i already and never i brag no more when a pill like thissy upsot me but miss clara god bless her beautiful eyes she nurse me just as if she were my own darter with the apron on as you give her and you should see the kitchen honour you loves the kitchen so they be a bilin and roastin arl day and they be vorced to swipe the chimbley three times in a fortnight the rest of this glorious message about three pages long i am forced to suppress i only hope anne maples remembered a quarter of it but his wonderful miss clara did nurse him long hearing from the surgeon that all the danger was over by the end of the following week so strong was the constitution conrad lily and i set sail for corsica on our melancholy errand in that letter which seemed to come to me from the grave my poor uncle after expressing his joy and deep gratitude at so happy a close to his life continued thus yes my dear child the close of my wasted and weary life you may be surprised and perplexed at what i am about to tell you but you are not one of those low-minded ones who condemn as superstition all beyond their philosophy the very night after you brought me my new lily a sweet thing just like her mother i lay for some hours awake broad awake as i am now i was thinking of my two lilies the lovely and loving creatures i was not in the least excited but calm reflective and happy soon after the clock struck two at the time when our life burns lowest i heard a soft voice sweet as the music of heaven call me by name three times of course i knew whose it was too often that voice had murmured upon my bosom for me not to know it now not rashly but with a mind long since resolved i answered sweetest mine her own artless and young endearment sweetest mine no longer will i keep you lonely no answer came in words but the light the golden light of my own love's smile as i had seen it in corsica when she came from the grave to comfort me and now as after that visit i fell into a deep and perfect rest such rest as comes but rarely until the sleep of all no wonder you and lily thought me so strong next day in the morning i knew and rejoiced in my quick departure this cold obstruction was to be cast aside this palsied frame to release the winged soul on the third day i was to find and dwell with my lily for ever so on the first day i enjoyed the harmless pleasures of life and could not bear you to leave me because that would have turned them to pain the second day i got through all the business that still remained refreshing its dryness often with my sweet child's society on this the third i write to you and am through the grace of god as calm and content nay more content 
than if i were going to bed beloved daughters both and my dear son as well i implore you not to grieve painfully for me too well i know the weight of excessive sorrow and how it oppresses the lost one even more than the loser since the parting is so brief the reunion so eternal why make the interval long and dreary by counting every footstep alas it is easy to talk and think so but very hard to feel it time demands his walk with sorrow and will not have his arm dispensed with then think of my happiness darlings and how your own will increase it only one more request which after ciceronian sentiments which cicero could not practise you are all too young not to wonder at if you my three children can manage it without any heavy expense or much trouble to yourselves it is my last wish as regards to the body that it should lie by the side of my wives the name of the little church st catherine's on the cliff can scarcely have escaped my clara's excellent memory lily lies beside her father in the right-hand corner towards the sea each of them has a cross of the seigneur's alabaster made from my own design lily's is enough for me put my name with hers not only did we look upon his last fond wish as sacred but we accomplished it in the manner that was likely to please him most we put his own lily flower the little love boat as they called it into commission again engaged a good captain and crew and taking old cora with us and set sail from gloucester for the mediterranean poor cora was now all devotion to conrad and lily ever since she found that they were lawful blood and direct heirs of the della croce the more recent part of the family story she had known only from her master's version and had set little store by the children as bearing the stamp of disgrace though she could not help loving sweet lily now by her evidence coupled with my dear uncle's deposition his relics and documents and my own testimony confirmed by balaam and balak we established very easily the birth and claims of my uncle edgar's children and the old count Gefori most venerable of seigneurs would have kept us a month at least to go through all his accounts he was entreated to retain his position as the guardian of our lily so far as our recent sorrow permitted enjoyment of scenery we were all enchanted with the balana at the funeral of signor valentine whose name was still remembered and loved nearly all the commune was present and many a dignified matron shed tears who had smiled as a graceful girl and strewn flowers at his wedding they were burning with curiosity to see our beautiful lily for the tender tale had moved them as southern natures are moved and many of them had loved and gloried in her mother but in spite of all this desire not a praying glance fell on her as she bowed in the hooded robe and wept to the mournful vicero foremost of all stood old petro and marcentonia who had found out and kissed with sobs of delight their beloved master's daughter for my part i loved the corsicans there is something so noble and simple about the men so graceful warm-hearted and ladylike in the woman and in a very short time i could understand more than half they said the black vendetta they told me was dying out among them and in a few years would be but a wonder of the past god in his mercy grant it there must have been something surely in my uncle edgar's nature which won the southern hearts as my father won british affections such things i cannot explain or account for i only know and feel them we were all back at vaughan st mary before the end of august and found the farmer with two chillers and beany daw as happy as if they were born and reared there old cora was left in veduta tower and having obtained mr daw's permission i presented her once and for all with the whole treasure of the gordit she intends however to bequeath it to me in her will soon afterwards conrad gave her a more substantial blessing for he sold the things left in lucas street under letters of administration as being the next of kin all the proceeds he handed over to cora except one-tenth which he presented to the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals as many of the specimens iguanodon and other monsters fetched prices as hard to explain away as themselves poor cora was amply provided for all which of course she attributed to the holy madonna's heart and now at last i understood how nineteen grove street had become number thirty seven lucas street the change of number i have already explained the change of name was on this wise 
the builder a rising man who had bought the old part of the street and built thereto the new one had a son a fine undergraduate better skilled in the boats than in the books of oxford reading hard one day after his third pluck this young man discovered that lucas was the latin for grove he smote his hand on his forehead and a great idea presented itself had there not been both nymphs and philosophers in the grove the street that was his inheritance should be distinguished by nomenclature from the thousand groves of london wherein the nightingale pipeth not neither but i am getting poetical and don't understand the gratis enough that he wrote at once and earnestly to his father forgetting the vivid description which was now growing stale of his pluck a result secured as the winchester gentlemen tell me by learning too solid to carry but begging that his oxford career might at least be commemorated in and by the street that paid his bills there lucas he wrote plainly enough and in very large letters but the father read it lux no said the mother she was sure alexander never meant such a low thing as that it was lucas of course why the lucases were her own cousins and rosa such a nice girl she saw how it was that she did and alexander might have done worse and so it was painted most bravely lucas street and the builder wasn't going to make a fool of himself when alexander protested when john huxtable set off for home just in time to see to his harvest which is always late round exmoor i kissed him i connie you saw it and thrust during his amazement something far down into his mighty pocket which something he was not upon any account to look at until he got home it was a deed prepared by our solicitors presenting him with the fee simple of tossel's barton farm true i was not of age but i signed it as if i had been and connie and i again signed it when we paid our first visit there perhaps in strict law it binds not my interest even now but if ever any one claiming by from through under or in trust for me forgets the vaughn honour and dares to dream of that farm i'll be at him as sure as a ghost and i trust before that time comes the farmer will have sound title by immemorial years of possession he is now a prosperous man and has never found it necessary to give up his beer as he threatened young john who is just like his father cleaves fast at tabby badcock now a blooming maiden but my sally has more than balanced that imminent loss of caste by fixing the eyes and transfixing the heart of george tamlin the son of our principal tenant and himself of devonshire origin the young lady comes to and fro every six weeks and is to be married from our house when her father considers her zober enough beany daw who does not like work still lives at tossel's barton and is in receipt of a pension of sixpence a day from government as a bard at last appreciated as for me clara vaughan on the very day after that which released me from my teens counting forward as we do till we count receding years to wit on the thirty first of september eighteen fifty one i did not change my name but wrote it in the old church register half an inch below a better and firmer hand there was no fuss or frippery no four clergymen and ten bridesmaids simpering at one another our good vicar represented the one class dear lily and annie franks the other my godfather newly disclosed for the purpose gave me away very gracefully and young peter green helped conrad lily vaughan looked so exquisite so deliciously lovely that nobody in the whole world now connie hold your tongue i never fish for compliments don't degrade yourself so for a kiss of course i know all my perfections but how can i care about them when you say they belong to you lily vaughan i say once more was such a sunrise of loveliness that young peter green just new from his oxford honours collapsed and fell over the railings and i wedged his head in the piscina or whatever those nice young gentlemen who see the duty of wearing straight waistcoats are pleased to denominate it ah little distaff lane most unconnubial title ah firm of green vowler and green our hercules holds the distaff and holds it alas in his heart from that shock he never recovered until we had at vaughan park a really merry wedding and i ah me i could not dance just then but showered roses upon them for the shadow of death was past my old green nay nay not fifty yet but our lady mr peter green the elder 
came down here for the occasion and i hardly ever took such a fancy to any man before he seemed to know almost everything not by the skin as dr ross seemed to hold things but by the marrow and fibrine of alignment of their alimentary part and withal such a perfect gentleman he kept in the horns of his knowledge instead of exalting them and making us wish for hay on them while tossed in headlong ignorance scant as i am of space i must tell how he behaved when his son revealed his attachment is it a lady peter i should rather think she is father do you love her with all your heart of course i do every bit i am tough but i know i shall die unless that will do my son you have my full consent and your mother's is sure to follow most likely you got it beforehand young fellows are so deep let me kiss your forehead my boy although i am not dramatic having behaved so nobly for this boy was his only hope he deserved to find as he did that if he had searched the world he could not have hit upon any other so desirable for his son as the daughter of his old friend the only mistake he has made is that he so adores her he cannot bear her to be in corsica though the trade they conduct is worth at least fifty thousand a year when lily fell in love i told her that it was because she had an eye for the olives and olives enough the darling has i trow and olive branches too the eldest is called clara clara green i don't like the sound altogether but the substance is something beautiful and the freshest of all spring verdure nevertheless my clara is an inch larger round the calf and i think her eyelashes are longer her hair weighs more that is certain we compare them very often for they live only half the year at veduta tower in the summer heats they are here and the children between them my own every bit as bad leave dear annie elton annie franks of old uncommonly few british queens it is all mr shelfer's fault what is the use of a gardener if he allows desert all the day long every autumn we go to corsica to help at the olive harvest and rarely we enjoy it the old veduta tower is like a nest in the ivy chirruping with young voices and the happy sleep of the two who loved so well is dreaming if dream it can or care to do the fairest flowers in europe scattered there by little soft hands connie is wild every time about the rogliano and lori and if peter green listens to him which every one does except me he will introduce very slowly of course those fine-bodied yet aerial wines to the noble british public that loves not even intoxication unless it be adulterated o oh, queer mrs shelfer o oh, balaam and balak shall i pretermit your annals the two sheriff's officers having secured their award set up therewith a public house called the posse committitus which soon became the headquarters of all who are agents or patients in the machinery of levying as at such times all people drink and pay more than double the public house has already a queen's bench full of good will poor mrs shelfer and charlie did not invest the three twenty-five altogether judiciously at least it went mainly to purchase eternal gratitude whose time does not begin to run till the purchasers is over but patty i am glad to say has still that three o one a year of her own left to her in the funds by good and grateful miss minto can't touch it my good friend not the queen the lord mayor and all the royal family government give their bond for it on parchment made of their skins and the ink come out of their gall be this as it may what is much more to the purpose is that mr shelfer cannot touch it and now i have pride in announcing for i never expected such glory that all the cats and birds squirrels mice and monkeys live like the happy family in our northern lodge where patty is most useful and happy as the queen of the poultry in a word they keep the gate not of their enemies but of old and grateful friends i expected to see at least a leading article in the times when mr shelfer left the metropolis but they let him go very easily for the sake of the discount market they gave him only two and twenty dinners but when he first came to vaughan park how he wanted country air now he attends to the wall trees and the avenue and i hope finds harmony there at any rate he never breaks it by any undue exertion nevertheless his very long pipe is of some account with the green fly which has been very bad on our peaches ever since they replaced the corn laws mr shelfer accordingly is compelled to spend half his time in smoking them 
wonderful nice they do taste miss clara you'd be quite surprised you know wonderful good miss and very high flavoured you know when they begins to fry come come mr shelfer i fear you cultivate them for their flavour there are ten times as many of them i see as of the peaches on the trees and you charge me every week five shillings for tobacco to be sure miss clara shows a fine constitution you know and dreadful hard work it is to have to smoke so much you know and then the sun will come on the wall and only a quart of beer allowed in the afternoon and sometimes they make me go for it myself you know indeed they does miss they have such cheek here in gloucestershire patty brought all her sticks of course in spite of the twenty-five bills of sale which by this time had grown upon them one whole roomful was packed in the duplicate inventories the law on this subject she contemplated from a peculiar point of view lor miss i never grudges em they do cost a bit at the time but see how safe they makes them if it wasn't for them i should be frightened out of my wits of thieves down here where the trees and all the green grocery is worse than the regency park bless me i never should have gone out of doors miss if you hadn't pulled me and to see the flowers here all a-growing with their heads up as beautiful as a bonnet pray my good friend is that what they was made for if i may be so bold no patty not for bonnets they were made for the bees and the butterflies and for us to enjoy them while they enjoy themselves well i never pray miss did i tell you uncle john's come home and they only ate a piece of his shoulder for they found his belt was tenderer and he put the glazing on it the same as they wears in their hats and three cork pins to hold it and he find it weary convenient it saves so much rheumatism and he'll be here next week to convict the man that made his wife swallow the teapot dear dear what things they does do in this country not a bit like christians and so miss clara the old man won't drop off at all and uncle john a-coming how nice it would have been the old man was poor whitehead whose lodge mrs shelfer coveted it was larger and livelier than her own no mrs shelfer i think he will get over it surely you would not wish to hurry him to be sure my good friend no no let him have his time i say but he would have had it long ago if he had any reason in him what good can he do now holding on with his eyebrows please god to let him go in peace and so much happier for us all when uncle john appeared he scolded me for my want of intelligence on the night when i was blinded of the four men in that room the one whom i had noticed least was the very one whom he had meant me especially to observe at least so he said but i fully believed and did not scruple to tell him that he had discovered little beyond the information and description given at the time by mr edgar vaughan these he had disinterred from the archives of bow street and whitehall and was then trying to apply them however i forgave him freely inasmuch as but for my blindness even blind love would have known me an objectionable being and now i come to a real grievance when there is another miss clara such a beauty i can't tell you and a little harry for whose sake this tale is told why will every one on these premises even the undergardener's boy persist in calling me miss clara it makes me stamp sometimes and such a bad example that is for my children dear me if either of my ducklings were to carry on as i did at their age i would cut down immediately the largest birch tree in the property and order a hogshead of salt but to return to that contumely it is to be suspected that i was more forcible and pronounced in the days of my trial and misery than now when i am the happiest of all the young mothers of england come connie tell the truth now don't i keep you in order my own delight i should think you did i am nearly as much afraid of you as i am of little clary clary ride on judy now and harry on pup sampero come and see papa go chip 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 no clary stop and see mamma go scratch 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 like cookie at the pie crust clary love mamma to-day and papa to-morrow and the lovely dear jumps on the stool to pull the top of my pen harry pops out from under the table and prepares himself for onset my husband comes and lifts my hair and throws his arm around me it is all up now with writing darlings i love all three of you to-day to-morrow and for ever only don't pull me to pieces end of book five chapter eleven end of clara vaughan volume three by r d blackmore